Hey guys, Jason here. Want to talk about my other podcasts. We did one that's more business oriented. Um, it's called Higher Density Living. And if you haven't subscribed to that one, it is more of a spiritual podcast. But we get into things pretty heavy like this one. We got into blockchain. We got into decentralizing political, economic, and social systems. What the world is going to look like. What the future looks like for business. We got heavy into that. And so I wanted you guys to listen to this one. I hope you enjoy it. If you like this episode, then I guarantee you're going to like the others. I'm the co-host, but the main host is Alexander McCabe. Good friend of mine. He's a tech dude. Super data scientist. Um, If you like all that geeky stuff... Like I said, if you want to know about Bitcoin and blockchain and what it looks like, what we're going to have when we don't have borders, when countries start becoming more fluid with the way that they exchange information, all of that is on this podcast. It is called what a decentralized future will look like for our world. So I encourage you to listen to it. You're going to hear the intro from the other show. I just put that show into this. Um, Look at the show notes. Subscribe. It's Higher Density Living Podcast. Love for you to subscribe to it and support it. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Look within. Look within. Look within. And live your life life on the edge of two worlds. A reality where you find true understanding of who you are. Take the step into the unknown with Alexander McCaig and Jason Rigby. As they explore the thinly veiled world of consciousness, spirit, and the human condition. Join them in embodying the oneness of all. Walk the cliff's edge between the seen and the unseen realities. Welcome to High Density Living. Oh, the goosebumps are stepping in. I'm fired up. <laughs> well, I think maybe because we have a uh, Egyptian dog here with us today. Yeah, he's a good boy. Yeah, we have um, Yo Doggy. He's been on the show several times. Anubis, are you back on air? Come here, buddy. <laughs> Everybody here. can see him. Up here. Come on. Get up. Hop up. Can you do that for me? Can you speak? Speak for the mic. Speak. Good boy. Thank you. Yeah, he's a good boy. Go get your bone. Yeah, <laughs> no, we're glad to have him. He's a good energy. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, of you course. know, because we're in here, things it can feel a little static right. apart from you and I. So it's nice to have uh, the energy of an animal in here. I think that well, really he helps. was on our, he was on, we did two shows of Why Dogs Love Us. Yeah. And so if somebody wants to know why their dog loves them, yeah, um, they can listen to that. And, and what you can learn from them. Mm. Man, they teach me so much. You yeah. know, and you got Zoe over here all the time. Yeah. Learn, teach, teach, learn. Oh, isn't that funny? Yeah. Just to be, um, you know what I've learned from dogs, I think the most is just to be present. Yeah. Yeah. You know, being present doesn't mean you don't have to think about your past or not consider the future. It's just saying, appreciate the moment that you're in right now. Don't always be thinking so far forward. You can make decisions in the present now for the future. Right. But you can still live in the present. You know, you don't have to, it's not going to take away from that. And guess what? But they perfectly live in the present. Dogs they're, do. They're, it's because the past and the future is an illusion. It is an illusion, right? It makes no, it's, it actually makes no sense they, at they, all. They, they thrive in the present. They, they don't have any issues. Consider this. I'm glad you said that. If we are living in the present, and if you're only making good choices by enjoying and living in the present, right. how can you not have a positive outcome in the future? <laughs> I, I always ask people, it's like, would you rather live in the future you know, would you do that, would you want your thought process to be consumed of everything that's going to be on the future? Your thought process consumed of the past, or would you like to live in the present? Hundred percent of people always say they'd like to live in the present. Yeah, but the thing is, they always are thinking in the future. Yes, <laughs> there are are thinking of past mistakes or beating themselves up. You damn the hypocrites! Past. Just let it go. Or this is the this is the one that got me until I had to realize this is labeling yourself or giving oh. yourself identity because of the mistakes that you made in the past. Yeah, that's it has that has nothing to do with anything. A dog doesn't think of the mistakes they've made. He doesn't think of it at all. Look at him. <laughs> Last time he was here he took a dump on the floor. Yeah. You know? He doesn't think he's not thinking about that. And again, like he said, there was a there was a courteous thing he yes, did. Yeah. You know, we're not taking like, it as a threat. Hey, Jason, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, you're and then when you look at that label and then you start defining yourself by something in the past that right. doesn't even exist anymore. All it was was the experience that mattered. Right. You know, but it only, what the crazy part is, is it only exists in that thought that you give it. Right. In the present. Yes. So truly, you're only <laughs> ever in the present. 
<laughs> That's the crazy part. Yeah, people don't realize that. The and this is the this is the beautiful one. The power that you give it. Yes. That past thought is because you're thinking of it in the present. That's but correct. But there's no power in and of that moment. Yeah. And then you're allowing it. It has no power at all, actually. Right. Neurologically, you're allowing it to change and make your stomach hurt and do all these crazy, get throw all these crazy emotions. Yeah, yeah. Throw your hormones. No, forget it. And you're doing that. All of that is being created in the present. Yeah. Not in the future. Not in the past. Yeah. And that's no. one of the things we can learn from dogs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Anubis. <laughs> You smart, smart little animal. Well, I've got a lot. I've got, I was showing at the show, I've got uh, about 60 pages of notes here. So. I'm glad you brought uh, Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> Speaking of Webster's Dictionary, um, we're going to be talking about decentralization today. I want to give the actual definition of this. Jason, so that how people, could that even turn into something spiritual? It, it's going to. <laughs> You're going to see uh, w- what is happening. We're going to get into a little bit of history. Okay. We're going to get into uh, a French, uh, we're going to get into the French Revolution. Oh, we, oui, we. Oui. Yeah. And oh, we're going to get into libertarians and anarchists. Oh, and- great. This is so exciting. <laughs> yeah. So decentralization is a process by which the activities of an organization, particularly those regarding planning and decision making, are distributed or delegated away from a central authoritative location or group. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the government tell you how to feel about yourself. I'm asking you, did the government can tell me how I feel about myself? I know. Should, should they tell you? No, like, uh, I'm gonna give you an instance. I, I think it's, I, I like the idea right now we're in COVID-19. I like the idea of wearing a mask to protect others. I think it's a selfless act. Mm-hmm. I think that's good. But when the government comes in and mandates it, yeah. I personally haven't like that's came out, you know, our city here in Albuquerque um, came out and said, you know, that we're going to have severe fines. And the government said there'll be a hundred dollar fines if you're not wearing a mask out in public. Yeah. I think it's, even if it's a chance of me to give it to you just to have that selfless love of humanity, sure. put the mask on just to protect, even if the science is pseudo or, you know, everybody, cause this is very, I hate to be on polarizing issues. You're um, on it though. I know. I hate to be on polarizing <laughs> issues when it's so polarized because then Everybody gets that emotion gets so oh, caught up in it, of and the left and the right, yeah. and, you know, and mask, this thing of mask ends up turning into, but I, I don't like the idea of the government coming and mandating me wearing something. I don't, yeah, I don't mind them suggesting. Yes. And like vaccines, you don't have to get them. Right. But 80% of people do get them. Right. You know, and yes. the other 20%, whatever, you know, you do you. If 80 percent of the people want to wear ma- wear masks to just you know help with the herd immunity, go ahead. Right. You know, by all means. But if someone would come in and tell me this is how I got to walk, this is how I got to talk, this is how I'm going to eat, and this is how I have to interact. Right. That seems to be an issue because then you're towing on the line of the decision and free will of um, an individual. And so, where does that line draw in a decentralized effort? when it gets into libertarianism and then anarchy, right. And then remove the systems altogether. Yeah. And I think let's, I want to start the opposite with centralization and it came into us in France in 1794 as the post French revolution. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the French directory, they called the French directory leadership at the time created a new government structure. And so um, that was in 1794 and that's where centralization came in decentralization did not come into usage in the literature until the 1820s. Um, and it was by, and I'm going to pronounce this guy <laughs> wrong. I always do, don't I? It was during the French Revolution. Uh, Tocqueville? Is he French? <laughs> yes. I don't know. Tocqueville. <laughs> Tocqueville. <laughs> That's probably some Italian in there. But um, he began writing, um, and and he even said, we need to have a push towards decentralization. Um, and... What ended up happening was in the late 1800s, it became an extension. And this is what we're seeing with data and the internet. It became an extension of centralization. Mm. Even though there was a push for decentralization, yeah. you know, it became an extension of centralization. And I think with the privacy and the internet that we're seeing, you know, with the laws that are being passed and then these big companies taking data. And if you want to know more about that, they need to go on our very popular YouTube channel. 10,000 hits. 10,000 hits. 10,000 views just this month. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Tartle.co. Or they can go to YouTube and type in T-A-R-T-L-E. Yeah, we'll pop up. Yeah, and we'll pop, we will pop up just like this. Yes. Um, and this gets into it a little bit more. But 
Whenever we look at decentralization, it was in 1863, a retired French bureaucrat, Maurice Bloch, can pronounce that, that sounds very French, wrote an article called Decentralization for a French Journal. And then he reviewed the dynamics of government and bureaucratic centralization. Um, and then the French efforts at, they, he started breaking it down, okay. looking at decentralization. So I think that's the biggest is when you start looking at, and our anarchists look at this, you know, when you start looking at, you know, bureaucracy and government. Right. You know, when we look at um, anarchy, they, you have the principles and anarchy is the step past libertarianism. So life, liberty, property, that's what the libertarians care about. And then if you tow that line, if the government starts to restrict that, that's where the anarchists are like, no, absolutely right. not. You know, that's not going to happen. And those are, you know, very fundamental principles. Even the founding fathers of the United States believed in life, liberty, and property. Yes. They believed that you were the king of your own land. You were a sovereign. Only until it became the United States Corporation did that change. <laughs> yes, exactly. I hate saying that. It, makes, it doesn't make me feel good. Um, but before that, you know, they believed in that sovereign issue, but the, it was a centralized aspect. So, okay, here's a unified government of all these different member states that come together. It's the United States. Right. So it's a decentralized effort, but we've taken it and actually centralized it. And so what we're looking at now is that society is now like, oh, wait, we got to bring that back. Let's. That's actually, why states' rights were so important. It was extremely important because they were saying the state is a sovereign. Right. And the people within it are a sovereign. But now that line's become so blurred. It was, it's been blurred in technology over who really owns what. Yeah, it's like, it's like taking um, you know, government military employees and putting them in these cities right now with the riots. Yeah. That, that's kind of yeah. like, I, when I look at that, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I know there's craziness going on, and the anarchists are taking, some of the anarchists are taking advantage of it. Yeah. Not all anarchy is bad. No. A lot of, a no, of forward-thinking writers, and we're going to get into this, were anarchists. Thank you. Oh, man. Everyone thinks anarchy like means burn everything. It yes. doesn't. Like no government. No, it just and, means and just rape and pillage. people can take care of themselves. They can self-police. And if they want to have someone speak on their behalf, it's not their leader because they all lead themselves, but that's the communal effort to have that person speak for the voice of the group, but not decide for the group. That's the positive side of right. an anarchist movement. But when you're talking about, you know, the negative side, that's like burn, you know, you know, get rid of all the laws, remove everything altogether. You know, it's nice to have a, a sense of structure. It gives people something to, you know, keep themselves in line with because when people lack structure, they don't know what to do, you know? It's not like I, I give you um, a pencil and a blank piece of paper and I say, I want you to write nice even lines all the way across. Right. Just write sentences and you're all over the place. Right. A little I bit would of, be all over the place. A little <laughs> bit of structure I helps. I have no artistic ability. <laughs> drawing a straight, drawing a stick figure, yeah. tough for me. I believe it. I <laughs> yes. don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all. But, you know, when we look at that, you know, even if you're on like a spiritual path of learning, understanding creation, you have to understand the structure of creation itself. It has a structure to it. And we talked about in the previous episode with its mathematics. So if we can appreciate the small amounts of structure and then pull it into a decentralized effort, that means you don't have to have the toe stepping line of, you know, military coming in and pushing around or a government deciding for you what you need to be doing. Right. They can appreciate you as a sovereign, a physical material sovereign. And then, you know, if we were a little bit more elevated, they look at you as a spiritual <laughs> sovereign. I'd really appreciate that. Yes. Um, but I think that's where we find, that's where you have the really nice balance of decentralization that we're actually headed towards. Yeah. And I, and I like uh, Norman Johnson. Uh, he wrote a bunch of papers on this and this was in 1999. So we'll, we'll move forward a little bit because yeah. I want to explain this. And he talked about in a systems approach. And I wrote, what I really like is he's from Los Alamos national laboratory. Get out of here. Yeah. Good for so, him. Yeah. We're right near there. Yeah. Not I think too we far. probably wave to him. Yeah, exactly. He said this, a decentralized system is where some decisions by the agents are made without centralized control or processing. An important property of agent systems is the degree of connectivity or containment between the agents, a measure global flow of information or influence. Mm -hmm. I like those two key, uh, key words, information, influence. If each agent is connected and exchange states of influence. Sounds like turtle. To all other agents, then the system is highly connected. Yeah. And, and that's what we were saying where in centralized political systems or states or sovereigns, when you centralize it, they become very disconnected. 
here's the silo. Everything has to sit inside of it, and you have to come to the silo and right. like, request things from it. Right. What he's saying is that the systems become so efficient if you can put them in their own little sphere, but have them interconnected through this web where they can efficiently you know, move information back and forth because – we spoke about this, that information is the basis of society. Right. It's our Maslow's hierarchy needs. We need information to analyze so we can survive. And then on top of that, then we can look at societal interactions. But the efficiency of how that information moves is really what matters. People are interactions, just nature. Nature is naturally decentralized. But it's always listening. It's always sharing information, like trees and their roots. A, whole, a tree in a forest that is sick the rest of the trees are going to know in their system that there's a sick tree out there and they'll send nutrients and water to its roots. But they're all decentralized. They're all their own sovereign beings. Right. And it's all well-respected. And that system has been working for billions <laughs> yes. of years. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, so when we're looking at that, he's he, he's he's really right um, from his Los Alamos, you know, very scientific yeah, perspective. Yeah, wait, wait, wait till you hear this. So he says this. He writes that diversity plays an important role in decentralized systems like ecosystems, social groups, ecosystems, yeah. large organizations, political systems. Diversity is defined to be unique properties of entities, agents, or individuals that are not shared by the larger group population structure. Decentralized is defined as a property of a system where the agents have some ability to operate locally. Both decentralized and diversity are necessary attributes to achieve the self-organizing properties of interest. Right. So I think that's important because I think when people think decentralization, they think you lose your identity. No, there's yeah, there's, that's great. I'm glad you said that. There's no loss of identity. Okay, the trees are de- decentralized, but you know it's a tree. Right. Right. You go into the jungle, all of the entire ecosystem there is decentralized, but you know that's a bug. That's a poisonous snake. Right. Don't go near it. You realize that this is some sort of uh, they don't grow palms down there, but tropical tree. You know, the but, ecosystem is the decentralized system as the whole, but it's extremely efficient. But that palm tree that has the one leaf that's all that's a, that's, up, a, that's that's its identity. That's, that's the its, diversity yeah. of it. Right. So when we look at the diversity of these ecosystems, you look at something really special, and you look at the efficiency and the life that can actually bloom and flourish out of it. Mm-hmm. And they maintain a perfect balance because if you have a decentralized system and everything shares the same characteristics, it is then becomes a just giant centralized system. Right. There's how can you measure efficiency in a decentralized system if everything's exactly the same? It has to have that diversity within it so then you can truly measure the efficiency by something that carries its own identity but still has the ability to operate within this systems network and share that information. So, if we look at you and I and we go out and we're in like a big event like the balloon fiesta around here, which got canceled this year, which yeah, that's terrible <laughs> news. Um there's a lot of us interacting as human beings. And we do this day in, day out, and we all have our characteristics. We show up in our own clothing. Right. We have our own way of purchasing our tickets. Right. We dr- we're going to drink our coffee a certain way. We're out there watching the balloons go up, and all the pilots are going to fly a certain way. But the whole system functions with a little bit of structure telling people where they can walk and where they can't, where the pipe of information goes. It allows millions and millions of people to enjoy something, and there's a lot of economic benefit from it. There's a bloom. But it's completely diverse. But but what I love about it is it's also submissive to nature in the sense that there's like I've talked to a lot of balloon pilots and they all talk about this. That Albu- the reason Albuquerque is so amazing compared to other places in the world is that um, there's almost channels of air yes. that the balloons go, and so it's dictated by that. The, there wouldn't be a balloon fiesta. Balloons wouldn't come from literally all over the world. And thousands of balloons be here. It's an amazing site. You guys should look it up. Just yeah. type in Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta. Um, that would not happen if it wasn't our submission to nature. And if we put balloons here and then we started fighting that, you would have disaster. Yeah, you'd have to put fans on it and then everybody's flying around. But it's they carry themselves with the nature. Yes. And the whole thing works. Yes. You can have thousands of balloons in the air and no fatalities. Yes. You can have millions of people on the ground and no fatalities yes. because they allow that flow, the diversity, the interaction of this decentralized effort to actually occur. And if you want to apply that in a spiritual sense, well, it's like, okay, I'm going to maintain my identity, but my information tells me that you're going to maintain it also. Right. I know you have a spirit inside of you and you're going to share something with me. Whether whether it be preference for hip hop music or it be a sexual preference. Whatever or, it might be. Yeah, whatever it might be. And I can appreciate it. Right. And we can still be immensely efficient. Right. So now mother nature, okay, nature or creation understands the value of the spirit and those laws. You know, the, the value in diversity in decentralized network systems. If we can see that value of what's so plainly in front of us, so what's so obvious. Right. 
it would do us a lot of good. And what he's saying when a system's, if you want to apply it to politics, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to go there? It's worked so well with everything else. It's very time-tested. It's the best time-tested scientific hypothesis out there. So if we apply that, even on a small scale, just me, you, and the dog in the realm, yes. there's an efficient process happening. Yes, exactly. I respect him for who he is, his spirit, the enjoyment he brings me. He appreciates us being here. And he adds to the energy of this whole situation, the dynamic of what's going on. Well, I want to prove it in a rapid, big scale. Oh, rapid, big scale. The industrial civilization comes on the scene, the printing press hits. Mm, yeah. The Catholic Church. They didn't like that. They're silo. They're centralized. They're like, we have the cap on religion. In fact, because the first thing that was printed on the Gutenberg press mm-hmm. was the Bible. So here's decentralization at its best. So here's what happens. The Catholic Church says, no, Bibles are only in the Latin Vulgate. Um, so they're only printed that. And a priest has to be able to interpret to you in Latin what the scriptures are saying. That's how valuable they are. So what happens, the printing press, they, you know, King James, mm-hmm. you know, which crazy king, if you read about him or whatever, decides to put put it in the English language. They go to print it. The Bible takes fire. So now everybody can read and see, oh, okay, I don't have to go to a priest or somebody higher to get my religion. I can go directly and read it. Yeah. So then guess what happens? Because of the printing press with the Bible and it being decentralized, now Christianity begins to take root all across the world. Yeah, it was honestly, it was the smartest thing that could happen. The church was fighting it because they believed a siloed effort to maintain a false system of power. I don't even want to get into them and them funding the Nazis. It makes me <laughs> freaking sick. But what you found Human is trafficking. That, yeah, oh, I, I, please. I can't even, I makes it. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, they're completely sovereign, tax-free bank that they use to just like siphon and you know, wash money. Their own bad people. How, how did how did they how did they say okay we're our own country? Here we go. Uh, they made uh, so they cut a deal with Italy. Italy had so many changing governments all the time, and the Vatican owned so much real estate. And so with these changing governments, you know, a government needs resources. So they're like, oh, we're going to take. We're going to take your land. We know you have this villa out here in the countryside. We want that for the government because we can hold value in that. And the church will be like, no, like absolutely not. And they're like, can we come to a middle ground? Let's come to some terms. You give us these, you know, you know, benefits, you know, outside of what your government is doing and you respect us as this, we'll give you this villa. And they did these all, you know, constantly all over the time, you know, time and time again. And, the government's kept toppling over. They require their, they get their assets back, but the things that were given to them, the powers, you know, that were indoctrinated to them, give them the ability to be a sovereign entity within these other countries. And it's so funny, the separation of church and state in the United States. And we look at that and everybody hates that, you know, um, if religion gets involved and, you know, especially like everybody's so angry at the far right, getting all that. And then you look at the Catholic church, they literally preyed on (laughs) countries that were, Weak. Almost bankrupt or they, weak. They preyed on weak nation states. And they do that now. They with- preyed on instability. They they you know, directly funded the trains that carried uh, the Jewish people, the, the original founding Jewish people in Rome, out of there by train to the concentration camps. The gold that came from the Nazis... Um, where that was smelted down teeth from you know the Jews that died in the gas chambers or anything else that was stolen from them, that was split and then also washed through the Vatican's private bank. And no one could ever do anything about it. And then when it became a real issue, you know, the the Nazis grabbed their passports from this, you know, this sovereign state. Yes. Like, oh, we'll give you a passport. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because they can, they can issue it. You know, and that's how the escaped Argentine and stuff like criminals that. go there. And side and, point. No. <laughs> okay, you could tell how much we appreciate uh, a siloed religions. Oh, we just love it. <laughs> so decentralization pr- printing press. That yes. right there was a perfect example. A common person, if they could read, they were able to. And then books came on the scene, and and even now from look at 1600s you and me. We love to, books. Yeah, we love books. Yeah, it's it's probably my number one hobby. Um, another thing that hits, and people don't realize this, what it did for lower and middle class America is the automobile. Mm. that invention comes on the scene. Yeah. And then what is great grandpa able to do? He can move. He can go wherever he wants. Now he has, people have the ability of movement. Movement is a fundamental right here in the United States. You know, the right of movement, you know, the right to ownership of certain things, but they were not, they didn't have a centralized transportation. 
No. It wasn't a subway that only subway and it only goes from point A to point B. Yeah, you weren't in Boston Common taking the green line, which, you know, went across the field with a bunch of dead, you know, Puritans underneath of the yes. were witches. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um that you know, that's the original subway line. But apart from that, it gave them the ability to be like, oh, I'm not limited by the train tracks anymore. Right. We can expand where we need to go, where we want to go. And there was a bloom at that point. It wasn't the car that actually created it. It was the idea of movement. Yeah. That's what was so key. Right. People were now allotted this movement to go explore in a way that they couldn't do before. It was much more efficient. Well, I think and, and Henry Ford comes on the scene and you start seeing this and then you see a decentralization of manufacturing. Sure. Yeah. So now you have mobility. Yeah. You have a decentralized manufacturing, so you have these local plants starting I can, to build. I can put them all where yes. I want to go. And now, oh my gosh, I, I have oil refineries here and here and here, and I got the gas, you know, the car manufacturers here and here and here. Now I've created a network, and we can share information, and we can build. And that's when industry really blossomed at yes. that point. That you was know? probably one of the most rapid periods up until now. Now we have the same thing going on with the internet. Correct. And now we've 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 switched. So we've left the material stuff and now we've moved into the immaterial aspects right. of it. So what's going on with our data and information on the internet? You know, people have tried to silo it. We know that the siloing doesn't work. Look at history. Let's decentralize. Let's go through the same effort and economic boon that we received when we decentralized everything else in the United States back in the late early 1900s, you know? And that's that's the stage that we're at now. Yeah, and, and this network could be fractured into pieces. Sure. And there was no, you know, one electric power grid with one computer, one data, one control. This all of a sudden began to say, oh, shit, it's, this is the World Wide Web. Correct. And um, I want to talk about something interesting here. That gentleman from Los Alamos, 1999, what was his name? Uh, hold on. Let me get back to you. We Norman need- L. Johnson. Norman L. Johnson touched on something ex- very specific here. He didn't say that the network, the decentralized network, was a material one. He said that information was the basis yes. of it. Yes. So even all these cars are doing all and this influence. other stuff. Information and influence, that exchange state. It's the exchange of that. Yeah. It's not the exchange of cars or oil or material right. goods. The real basis of things is, is you know information. Because information elevates understandings that allows people to self-reference, self become self-aware, to reflect on what's going on. And because information is shared, then people can operate. They're like, oh, this is new knowledge. Right. That's the real basis. You know, we can look at these other factors and say, oh, you know, it was the car. It was Henry Ford. Well, no, it wasn't. It was the access of information to move faster. The postal service could move information faster. You know, the availability of telephone lines to go all over the place so communication could increase. Right. It's always information as the fundamental. And that's the one thing we're not looking at here is we as characteristics as, you know, these beings of creation, we're walking pieces of information. We maintain this identity. We constantly share and create. Right. But it's not respected. The efficiency of our system of us being a sovereign is not respected. And this is what's towing us down the line to get us closer towards these, you know, these writers that have the more, you know, anarchist mindsets. And I, I want us to look at from 1980 to the early 1990s. So you had this, you know, 13, 15 year, um, well, I'm sorry, to the 2000s. Yeah. So you had this 23, 25 year till the tech bubble busted. Right. But I want us to get when the the first wave of the internet was happening in the 1980s, yes. when they first began to, to um, the early 2000s. I want us to look at that time frame because that was decentralization. Yeah, let's look at that. And so what happened was you had pure human relationships with the web oh, that sounds, at that time. Oh, that sounds good. And protocols were controlled by online communities. Then people, this is what people don't realize. Then the dot-com bubble hits. So investments come on the scene. Yeah. And then you had, in that moment, you had intense creativity, you had learning, you had development. And then after the bubble and all the money went away, then we started seeing monopolies form. Correct. And that's centralization. The creativity went away. And that's when you have the efforts of like the open source communities, yes. Linux communities. They're right. like, screw Microsoft, screw Apple, screw these operating systems. We as a people, a, co- a decentralized collective will manage our own operating system that is free, you know, and we can have that, those benefits of, you know, sharing information efficiently. We can run our own network. We don't need internet service providers. Right. We can just, we can take our Wi-Fi nodes and connect them all together. We can run without them, you know? And so these, these siloed efforts have, 
you stagnated creativity because now people have to focus on getting out of a siloed system again. They're like, you've stopped the creativity. Now we got to create tools to move us out of the issues we've created and ingrained ourselves in these monopolies and move into, you know, a non monopolized state, you know, it, and that's happening right now because we have something that's called distributed ledger technology. Yeah. Blockchain. And that right there is going to, and we can get it out, but that right there, it, it, it's, it's a snowball effect and there's not a way to control that. No, you can't. It's the catalyst. It's like right when you turn on the flow, the water flow for the internet, you can't shut it off. You know, you'd have to, you'd have to have a massive, you know, coronal mass ejection to, you know, shut down the whole network here on the globe. Yeah. And I love that. Listen to this. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin says this, Yeah, Rifkin, you know, yeah, you've mm-hmm. heard of him. Uh, he says about blockchain technologies, a nascent digitalized renewable energy internet. And now both those internets are converging with the fledging automated GPS and very soon driverless road, rail, water, and air transport internet. The blockchain is a stepping stone to a fully decentralized World Wide web. Yeah. It's it. Those properties of decentralization, sovereign ideas, it allows for, again, a decrease in those risks a, and an increase in the efficiency of maintenance and information transfer in the system so that you can have driverless cars. They can send information back that much quicker, right? And the yeah, note- the joke is you need to have four lawyers compared to every one driverless car. Yeah, exactly. That's the only thing that's holding all this up. Yeah, yeah. that's it. And so he's, he's, he's not wrong at all. You know, Rifkin, he's right on the money. And that sort of change, again, is another material step back to what is really important, back to the creativity, the original intention or purpose for what the internet was, Mm. right? I know in the late 1970s, you know, DARPA had their van in Southern California and they were doing the first internet transmission from one communications van to another, Yes, yeah, yeah. right? And the government's like, oh, that's pretty cool. We should probably use something like that to talk to one another. And they're like, oh, wow, we've had this for a bit. Let's, you know, one of the guys from the project's like, oh, why don't we introduce this to people? And then (laughs) the thing like explodes. It's a bloom, right? And then, you know, people come in like, oh, we'll be the ones to lay the fiber lines. So we'll control the internet. And then Wi-Fi shows up, right? And then uh, decentralized efforts of, you know, neural networks where people can just, you know, share off one another and transmit the information locally and not have to require one centralized line. But there's always people trying to get their fingers in there yes. and control the efforts of natural creative growth. Right. Yeah. Microsoft, there was an issue with antitrust issues. Yeah. When he was over here in Albuquerque. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was an issue with that where he was trying to control, saying, no internet Chrome, no, you know, nothing, only it's going to be my, the only way you're going to get to the web, the World Wide Web, is through my computer with my browser. Yeah, and when people are on the internet, they're trying to do something creative. They're trying to share information. And then when you restrict that flow, you restrict evolutionary growth. Right. Like if I go to the rainforest and I burn a big circle and then salt the land, I've restricted the flow of the the roots and the water to get into a certain area. It's not going to flourish as no. quickly. I yeah, I felt good because I was hoarding my little That's circle. That's my circle. Yeah, I have ten thousand species. I've inflicted pain on here in my little <laughs> Amazonian circle. But realize what you've done is you've you've disassociated it from the rest of the very diverse group. Its own right. neural network, right? Its own decentralized effort, and you've you've harmed the system. Because you had this idea of hoarding and greeting like you claim ownership over creativity. Creativity is a law of creation. Right. You wouldn't be able to be creative if creation didn't give you that ability. It gave you the free will, that choice. And to think that we have, and we talked about this on our last podcast, but to think that we have any type of ability to control. You, you have none. <laughs> be like a hot air balloon. Just right. realize that you're, you're floating up. You can go up or down, but you're with the current. Right, right. That's what you can You can maneuver in that, but that, that specific certain i don't i don't know what they call it. it's not tailwinds i don't they have it they said it's almost like highways up there yeah you know like the way that the it's like a perfect with our and elevation in the mountain them back yeah, and it forth. just shifts them and they can control the ups and down and they can choose to go into that stream or not they have that choice right creation gives that that stream there it's like do you want to move into that stream instead of us we're like why don't we put up a big sail and we try and catch all that wind and maybe we can turn it into something it's like no 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 let it flow and what i want people to understand with blockchain why this is so important and this is so huge is it's a million times more the speed, mm-hmm. the reach, the flexibility, and the automation and yeah. the capabilities that we can in what we currently have right now in the internet. 
It, this is like a, what we have now on the internet is a small sliver compared to what could happen if blockchain takes into full effect. Correct. And I, this is what the internet really needed for its leg up. Yes. It needed, you know, verified transactional records of information to actually map out the networks and the flow and where things were coming from truthfully. Right. That's important because then you can say the creative ideas came from here. The information was passed from this area, and then you can go back and reference that information. Was that information truthful? Was it actually beneficial? No. I don't want to receive information from this node anymore. It's actually, a, it's like a, a gut check for the whole internet. Yes, it is. Yeah. And now it's like, oh, now you gave me this liquid injection of, you know, exactly what I needed. Thank you for blockchain. Thank you for the ledger. This is what the internet needed to actually move itself up to the next level. It's like the hot air balloon saying, let's gas it to get up to the higher highway. Because we can move a lot quicker. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. because And one of the things that um, he talks about, which I think is is really interesting, is this. Um, there's something beyond communication. Ooh. And that, and this is that's going to get spiritual, uh, and I want you to explain this. There's something, be, the internet is beyond just communication. Being able to have faster speed, reach, flexibility, automation capabilities. The thing that's beyond is... And what's the most valuable is the co- the corners of human concern. Mm. How we can have a human concern or humanity collectively can have a concern. And then the ability to be able to fix it. The ability to be able to... Um, y- do you awesome. see what I'm saying? Okay. L- uh, what's a concern? World hunger is a concern. Right. How do we disseminate information across a network efficiently to say that, oh, look at this video. Look at the data that backs it up and where it's coming from all these countries with people that are starving to death. We can share this with everyone in this decentralized network. And we can truthfully say that this information came from here because of the blockchain ledger. Wow. This is now a concern for us to focus on. We can now use the internet as a proper tool to realize globally in our perspective Mm. what needs help. Yes. Where before it was very easily ignored. So now it actually brings things that were far away back to home. And that's a, a completely different mindset and frame of reference. That's an evolutionary change in the individual where they really need to look beyond themselves now to say that I am but a small fish in this enormous pond, but I do play a part in it. So how can I and a group of others who have this information, have it in front of us, become aware of a true human need that needs to be fixed so we can bring them up to the same stage that we're at now because they deserve it in every way, shape or form. And that's what he's talking about. That's that corner. And the internet having this ability with the blockchain, the decentralization allows for those concerns to properly be brought to light. Yeah. And then if you begin to take these evolving tech, you know, this tech that's out there now, when we start looking at quantum computers, we start looking at AI, we start looking at how machine learning is growing and rapidly. And then we have the ability to have, and I believe, you know, through studying and, and looking at this, a lot of these AI scientists have a good heart. Yeah. You know, um, I, I've listened to three, four hour podcasts with a lot of them. And it's amazing how that they hate the military industrial complex. They, they despise these big silos. They, they want, they want to leave a legacy of doing good, not, not in an egotistical way, but they, they're seeing the implications of what can happen. Yeah. And you know, what this reminds me of, um, when Oppenheimer and everybody was making the atomic bomb over here at Los Alamos, they, when they first dropped it, they were like, crap. Yes. I realized the power of atomic energy, you know, splitting the atom. But now I've seen what happens when you use it for a negative purpose. That's not something I want to be a part of. Yes. And so what you find is that these people with the AI, they understand that information is the basis of society that will allow for our growth, our evolutionary understanding of one another. And, you know, if a military industrial complex continues to silo and say that they're the ones that are going to have all the resource power and determine when things get released and our understanding and our ability to analyze, they're like, we don't want that. We're going to be scientists because we recognize those mistakes and we recognize the power of a decentralized network where if everybody's running their own AI, 
we have the ability of seven billion pieces, seven billion resources to come together and solve the problems at a much faster rate than the reliance on a centralized effort that's completely back black box and offers us no opportunity. Yeah, it's a, a collective intelligence. It's a collective intelligence, and that's a that's a brilliant thing because what we're doing with technology and AI. We're just mirroring exactly what is possible in our own spiritual nature that yes. creation has yes, given us. Exactly. Our spirit is the collective yes. nature of all of us, but now what we're doing is we're mirroring it perfectly with technology, and it's just now starting to get there. And that's when we find the apex of human evolution, where we were designing technology just to design technology and make technology efficient. Now we've created something that has true social purpose and can actually evolve the human being. And we're going to pair both of those things together. And that's when you have a real acceleration in the development of this, the human, its understanding, its purpose, and its point here in the universe. Well, let me tell you how corrupt the system is now. Oh, let's, yeah. Let's just go political real quick. Okay. I'm going to show you how corrupt it is. Polarize me. We know, we know, you yes. and I know, and, and many of the people that listen to this podcast know this, that with blockchain, there's 100% security. Yes. 100% fairness. Yes. 100% transparency. Correct. Why would the government not use that in voting? Why? Why wouldn't? Oh, because oh wait, it's fair, <laughs> distributed, and transparent. Yes. <laughs> Why would you want that, right? Why wouldn't you use? Because you start to break into a system that is on a faulty foundation, which they have power over. Yes. And this is what we're going to do. You know, not to talk about you know Tartle, but we're going to push Tartle into the voting system because yes. we can pull the entire globe in 24 hours. No one's ever been able to do that in history. No. And we don't have to rely on the government to get the answers. We're going to know specifically with traceability and transparency from verified individuals that this is exactly what they want and nobody will be able to fluff it up. Let's let's get into the corporate world. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's say... <laughs> get uh, it. Let's say, okay, shareholders. Yeah. You want to elect board members? Yeah. Let's vote on blockchain. That's exactly right. That's they, why. Why wouldn't they do that? Why wouldn't you want to do that? I know. Why wouldn't you want to? No, that's the real but, question. But. <laughs> yeah, but the thing is, they don't want it because people like to hoard, maintain power. They like the the thought of thinking they have power. They like the thought and the thinking that they can, you know, hold on to and attain and grab more resources that other people, you know, can't get their hands on to. And if you supercharge the internet, yeah, this is what people people don't understand. If you supercharge the internet with blockchain. It becomes this collective intelligence that we've created yeah. as a people. As a people. We the people. We put the value in it. We put teeth on it now. Yeah. George Washington just got to be so gooey about it. <laughs> I wish he knew, you know? Yeah, because it's it's the it's the liberty. It's life, liberty. Yeah, of, it's, like you said, your property. Blockchain? Yeah. With property? Yeah. It's, listen, it, 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 it's you know, freedom. Think about that. If you own a piece of property, I own a piece of property, and we have blockchain, and we can verify it through yeah. that, we don't need a title company. You don't need- Why do I got to pay taxes to someone to verify it? Yes. I don't yes. need you to push paperwork on the tax. Yes, exactly. And guess what? If the town needs money, the local area that, I, that I'm supporting, well, then we can distribute it through our ledger, and we can all see that it's hurting. So it's, it's like the sick tree in the woods, right? We are all here supporting this network. Now that we understand what's going on, we can give money to this centralized effort to support right. our little diverse system. There's no reason it shouldn't work like that. And it doesn't take away from anything else. It's just self-supported at the base, at the foundation, rather than let's send money to the top and have it drip down. Yeah, no, I love that. And I, and so when we look at blockchain, and then I want to kind of pull us into currency, because this is, you know, the the love of money is the root of all evil, Jesus said, you know, yes. that, which is greed, not yeah. money itself. So... um there's a guy, very, very sweet. I've watched a lot of his interviews, super smart guy, and I can't pronounce his name. I wish I could. The Ethereum founder. Yeah. Um, I think he's, uh, I, don't, I know he's Eastern European. I don't think he's Russian. No. I think he's from a small little country. Like, you know, closer to Belarus or something like that. Yeah, or something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah. Vitalik Buterin, or yeah. Buter, something like that. Um, he defines it this way, Ethereum, and I, I love this, and I want you to speak to this. It's a software decentralization along three axes. So I want people to get this. Architectural decentralization is how many computers a system is made up of and how many it can tolerate breaking down at one time. That's the architectural part. Political decentralization is the number of individuals, organizations that control the computers that make up a system. Mm -hmm. Logical decentralization describes how the interface and data structure behaves as a monolith or swarm. Love that word, swarm. Swarm's cool. Who 
whose constitutes parts could become to operate independently if it were cut in half, for example. Yeah. As he puts it, blockchains are politically decentralized. No one controls them and artic- are architecturally decentralized. No infrastructural central point of failure. But they are logically centralized. There is one commonly agreed state, and the yes. system behaves like a single computer. Decentralized systems are more fault tolerant, attack resistant, and collusion resistant than any centralized system. That is <laughs> it's so obvious. And the beauty of what he is talking about is he paid attention to what nature is happening around him. Yes. And he's like, wow, look at the resilience of this. It's not fragile. It's 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 robust. You know, it's fail safe. And if you apply that to uh, a transmission system, the World Wide Web, mm. if I take a, a architected structure and I put it into a transmission system and I share that structure with everyone, you've just reinforced the most foundational principles which life has actually sustained itself off of. It's there, absolutely beautiful, regardless of the currency. Yes, yes. The actual design and structure of it is genius and the transportation of it through this medium of the internet mm. That is a massive evolutionary state, and that's the real purpose. He doesn't care about the currency itself. What he cares about is how the information in the network actually integrates itself those and understands axes. itself. It's yes. these three axes. Yes, yes, it's the interaction of those three. Who cares about what the money is? Yeah, and and the the money is the tool. Like Elon Musk, you know, is the car. He's like, no, I want to get to Mars. He's like, I don't care about getting to Mars. It's yeah. that ability to create that technology along the way that gets you along the way to get there. And people always think of the internet and they think desktop. They think you know networking. They think a cable. What we don't realize is we have four billion people that have access to a flush toilet. Yes. But there are 8 billion cell phones in the world. Yeah. So not only do we have all these computers that that have, they are their own little hub, their own little system. We also have these little devices we hold in our hand. Yeah. There's 8 billion of them that could be decentralized. On top of the computers themselves. Yes. So you have this massive network of information that can move so quickly. Yes. And the availability and the affordability of that information to be shared, that's an educational upwelling of creativity. That's unstoppable. So if you have 8 billion mobile phones mm-hmm. and they have access to a bank, yeah, to a bank account, yes, and they could access it 24-7 whenever they wanted, then you've just disinvented the need <laughs> for a bank. Yeah, banks. So a little historic perspective on banks. Right. Okay, let me just give that because this is fantastic what you just talked about. The word bank, so Herodotus wrote the histoires. It was one of the he was one of the original historians, a uh, Greek guy back way back in the day. And what he realizes that civilizations were their power came from water. So they were called hydraulic civilizations. They built themselves on large riverbeds, streams, the Euphrates, right. things of that nature. Because they realized that if you can control the water, you control the society. So if we're looking at the word bank, that's because it sat on the bank of the river. The river is the current. You use currency to spend on things, right? It's the flow. It's cash in, cash Cash out. out, So what you're seeing is that a bank now is a metaphor of the old hydraulic civilizations of power, those centralized efforts. So the last straw was to say, get rid of the bank. I don't need to go to them. Why do I have to go to a bank to decide whether or not I want to give Jason money right here? Why should the bank decide? Why should the bank decide it's going to take three to four days for the ACH transaction to process? Because they got an FX rub where they're going to get a currency, you know, carryover profit from saying, oh, we can hold this for three days and trade it and then give him his money. I love so that. it's all this arbitrary nonsense yes, yeah. so they can continue to hoard more. It's now dumping the trillions of dollars into um, the big corporations now and using COVID as an excuse to, um, you know, to topple these small businesses. It's a and wash. Then more, why can't a small mom and pop's liquor store be open right now, but Costco is allowed to turn around and sell cases of cases of cases of cases of, of rum. You know what I mean? Case pallet loads. Vodkas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they're not appreciating the decentralized effort and they're crippling their own system. And so, you know, our, the internet is moving one way, society is moving one way, but the government and these, these, these black boxes and military industrial complex and these other monopolies are gripping onto the last remnants of a dying system. Yes. And they don't want to move forward, but they realize it's these 80 year old white guys that yeah. smoke cigars and I like cigars. We've got a humidor sitting right here. Yes, we do. But it's these 80 year old guys in stuffy suits that are the ones that in Davos and all those areas that oh are my God, the world economic forum. I've got to hold on to my power. Yeah. And if, 
here's an, here's a, just a point to show you the power in what's happening here with the decentralization, the effort of our evolution. The Department of Defense asked the Pentagon if they could put together a plan for the uprising of blockchain and cryptocurrencies because the banks will lose control right. and they're worried about the government losing control and where that's actually headed. So they've run a bunch of different probabilistic calculations on where this is going to go. And you can read it. Someone, someone actually, they published it online. You should check it out. So they know that it's yes. happening. Yes. But all these other people are holding on to the last parts of the system and these guys, you know, in the military industrial complex are like, you know, shit, you know, is this a security risk? How are we going to actually handle this? Because we, this is essentially giving control back to people when we were the ones looking at it. But if you look at the natural function of the system, it decreases risks, increases transparency, yes. has the traceability, and it allows us to evolve at a faster rate, <laughs> helps us understand. And if you educate people, if you yes. allow for information to flow, we can better understand one another. We can respect what we're doing as individuals, and that will allow us to appreciate and evolve, eradicate the racism, the efforts, the, the, the polarities that we see currently day in and day out. Allow that to nourish itself and foster like a fantastic you know, Amazonian jungle like it used to be before people burnt it down because we got to get wood pulp, pulp to burn, you know, to print our, you know, our books over here from the Gutenberg press up to what we have now to, right. you know, the big printing companies. That's not necessary anymore. Leave the Amazon alone. Leave us alone as individuals. Let us move where we want to move. Let us think how we want to think. Let us share information how we want to share. And let us evolve at the rate that we were given by creation the right to evolve at. And I, I want to share something about these guys that we're talking about, you know, this, this, this control and trying to centralize it. There's something that they don't realize. <laughs> They're all about the money. That's all it but is. But money, I want you to think about this. Money doesn't make the world go around. No. There's one word that does. It's called trust. <laughs> right. <laughs> Listen, Alexander the Great was taught by Aristotle. I don't even know if we put this quote in, you know, something else before, but he said, and I'm going to simplify this in layman's terms, that Money itself is of no value. Yes. No Just value. money is something that has no value. Money applied for lofty goals, things of purpose. Now the money has value. But that can only happen when there's trust in place, where an individual like you and me say that, okay, we trust this ledger, we trust the transaction, we trust the information that is going back and forth. That's where the value comes from. So these guys are like looking at all this money and they're like, this is what we need. This is where our power is. No, that's not what it is. We only need as a people an agreed upon value for our own transactions outside of your little sick system. Yes. But what we're trying to do is just move information. We're trying to evolve and you're sapping that evolution. Like if you go back towards uh, the, the earlier days when we had, you know, slavery was very potent here um, in the Americas. They didn't allow slaves to read because when you educate a man, you liberate a man. And those same concept have rolled forward into, you know, how the Rockefellers and the Department of Education, they don't want you to learn too much because we're... It, it, it's, it's the same with the church and the Bible. It's the they same with want, the church and the Bible. We, we've got you. Yeah, it's like, we've got you. It's like, why won't you just let us evolve so we can evolve away from you? It, we, it, you can continue to isolate yourself. We trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Corporations we can trust, right. real sovereign bodies that are foundationally, you know, instead of in God, we aligned. trust yeah. on our coins. Yes. It's, you know, in, uh, you need to trust us. Yeah. You need to trust us. We've and, got you. And we are creation. So we're higher should, up than you. It should say in creation, we trust. Because right. when you say in creation, you appreciate the, the being, you appreciate the human. And that's what we're trying to do. We're all trying to evolve, but people are you know, trying to hold us back with those old systems and decentralization that move towards what people are going to say, that's anarchy. It's not. And I want people to imagine this, that this potential that we have with this ability that's coming up on the scene with decentralization, imagine being able to go into any country and be able to prove yourself without a piece of paper. I glad Show you, me your passport. I'm glad you, know. you talked about that. So on Tartle, <laughs> I'm just going to tell everybody what we're going to do with our business plans. No, um, we already have the Tartle identity. Everybody should have their own self-sovereign identity. And wherever you go, it's verified. The government doesn't have to say that I'm a yes, human being, yes, yeah. that I'm a real person. I know I am. I'm standing here. But it's verified across a massive network yes. of information that is traceable, transparent, and truthful, <laughs> and highly efficient. And it's extremely robust. My passport, if I lose it, 
I'm not worth anything. I'm stranded. I'm screwed because it's a piece of paper. It's that old ideology that you have to be holding on to something physical, that the power is in the physical. Yes. But it's not. Power is in information and how that information is shared. These are the real things. It's power in the trust. It's, it's power the, in the, the trust. trust. It's that ability for that mom to be able to work at that hotel in Dallas, Texas and turn around and send money or yeah. information to her family back in India. Yeah. But and all, not have to go through all the process and percentage of it taking, we're going to take 8% because, you know, you're having to send it from this currency, to this oh. country and the exchange and everybody's making money. And off we, of we have to make money because we trust each other and right. we don't trust you. So it's like the banks, you know, the governments, the corporations, they don't want you to think that we can have any trust. Media right. companies don't want you to think that you have any trust. They show all the bad aspects of it. People can trust one another. We can do a pretty damn good job. And if you're not going to allow us to just do it innately, we're going to build our own system outside of yours so that we can show you how well our trust works. And, and that ability to have a truly, you know, democratic process where you know your vote actually counted. Yeah, because- And it was 100% true. Decentralization yes. is a democratization of yes. information. Yes. And that democratization of information only happens with that truth. Right. Now it's a real vote. Or, or my property is owned by me. Yeah, it's owned Period. by me. I own it. And I can I have trust in this and I can see this through these millions of computers that have that ID and that verification showing that I have that property. And how many more servers, you know, hard ones, clouds, everything is stood up every single day supporting the system. They're just, just in constant perpetual growth. And it's that dad in um Bangladesh that wants to start a digital marketing company because he has a great idea and he can do crowdfunding. Yeah. That's decentralization. It's decentralization of investment. $2,000 to be able to start this and not have to rely on a bank. But the IRS, they hate it. Mm -hmm. The SEC hates it. FinSec does not like it. They don't like the, the fact that we have the ability to raise money from one another. If we have a good idea, why should I be able to ask the public? Yes. Why do we need a qualified investor to be the only person to come in. Those are the holdups. These are the bars in our efficiency. This is the red tape. I'm yeah. And I, and, and I want to get into these human needs because we talked about it. So we have, tr- cause I'm trying to, I want to think more philosophical. So Let's we have, go. we have human concerns, human needs. Yeah. We have fast information flowing and we have trust. Yeah. Money's just a small part of it. You know I mean? Money's not the, the actual, it's the trust. So we have, the ability to have no poverty. Yeah. We have the ability to have zero hunger. We have the ability to have good health. And we're going to get into these good health and well being education system. <laughs> I love that. Oh, wow. Gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy. This is all the possibilities. Can with you this. stop talking to me about your utopia? Decent work and economic growth. Yeah. Industry innovation and infrastructure. Yep. Reduced inequality, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production. <laughs> we could talk for that for an hour. <laughs> Climate action, yeah, because that's what needs to happen. Action. No more talking and writing books. The life below the water, which sustains us. We have the ability to be able to fix that. Yeah. The life on land, peace, justice, and strong intu- intuitions, institutions, I'm sorry. And then partnerships that's decentralized for all of these goals. You know, that was the most poetic thing you've ever said. (laughs) Now, and you ask, you say that, you know, from a, from a philosophical sense, you're like, wow, is this stuff possible? Yeah, it is. The thing is the question, do you want to use the tools that are available now? And do you want to really, you know, juice the system up so we can get ourselves towards these absolute possibilities? These, these ideologies that were once we thought unattainable with failed utopias, well, they didn't have the ability of information and the tools that we have now. Yes. You, they didn't have the ability to actually move away into the self-sovereignty. You know, they were still, the perspectives were, they were blinded, they were clouded. But now these philosophical ideas are actually, they, they're becoming a reality rather than me sitting around just pondering about them. Yeah, and let me give you, I want to give people an explanation of how this works. Um so somebody, so you, you have a very poor farmer yeah, and he's growing coffee. Starbucks would have the ability to be able to pay them right off the bat through their mobile phone, even if they don't have a bank account. Correct. We need to think about that and to do it 
in milliseconds. And that's it's no longer, you know, the possibility you can do it with Tartle. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You can connect. We, everybody gets their own bank account that they own. We don't decide for a year. I don't even like calling it a bank account because it's not what it is. They got their own little, uh, like, trust nugget. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what I would call it. Uh, probably a trust nugget. But these, these are the possibilities. These are the utopian ideas that are tr- we're actually phasing into. Yeah, and, and, and it goes more than just banking. I want people to understand that. So you have Telegram, yep, which was an encrypted messaging app. Yeah. And and because I want to get into some very practical things that are happening. I want people to see that things are happening right now for decentralization. And this is the future. Correct. We we know this. I mean, we can see this. We know this. Um, it's a Telegram open network. It's a launch with test clients. for It's blockchain based. Yep. Um, and it's this ability to allow you have kick and you have all these that are beginning to expand into the being able to through messages, just through a simple text message being able to send money. Yeah. Like I could send you money. You could be in Singapore and I can send you money in a text message and you get it in milliseconds. And that's, listen, that's an unheard of thing. And you can't stop that pipe. They're going to no. try and shut it down. Like, but the thing is we're getting smarter about how to decentralize ourselves. We're getting smarter about how to change our IP addresses so that it doesn't look like we're coming out of a China of China and my government's telling me I can't use this webpage. It allows you to have continual communication and communication allows for information to flow. And that allows for those corners of humanity to evolve so that we can have a focus on something that actually needs a resolve. Yeah. And there's a company called Numera. And this is interesting. Big boys here. Yeah. Hedge fund model. Okay. So here's what they created. They employed a bunch of traders and quants mm-hmm. and decentralized it. So they're so Numera sends its thousands of, of all these quants, these encrypted data sets, and ask them to build predictive models. And then the best con- the con- best contributors are rewarded with tokens. And then, because th- there's going to be this, you're going to see this with Facebook and all that stuff. They're going to have their own. Eventually, this is where it's going to go. You're going to get tokens or money that you can spend on there because they're going to yeah. try to reward you on the platform. Yeah, because you're doing work. Yes. And then um, they take this, these meta models, and then they trade with them, you know, with these you know, they've got supercomputers and all that stuff. And then they turn around and they do the same with data scientists reward it. And they collectively, since it's all decentralized, bring this information together and they have this invisible collaboration and less competition. Yeah. There doesn't need to have that competition. Yes. And then again, you're acquiring the resources of people all across, across the globe on a unified task. Right. So your fit deficiency on it is just like phenomenal. It's actually, it's unheard of. And I want to get into decentralization for, um, Internet security, because right yeah. now it's it's all fucked up. Yeah, it's a mess. So the current internet architecture has proven easy to hack. Yes. I mean, whether it's J.P. Morgan Chase or whether you mentioned Experian. Yeah, Experian. Yeah, that had its uh, power plants. Yep. That are sitting there with a bunch of data in them, ready to be hacked at any moment. Um. So guess what happens? Now we have blockchain tamper-proof ledgers. Correct. That are sharing data across. Industrial industrial device networks all across the world. Mm -hmm. So if the, though the blockchain ledger is public, it's data communications are sent and verified using advanced cryptograph techniques. Yeah. It uses a shot to shot 256 big hash. So what it's saying is that within this hash, the computer has to run so many calculations before it actually verifies the transactions actually occurred. But then someone has to have a key which right. says, I know exactly how to move the numbers and letters in this hash, so it gives me some readable format for what the information is on the inside. Yeah, it's using its uh, blockchain-enabled KSI, a keyless signature infrastructure. Yeah. So, um, and I don't want to bore people. We could get into that. But another one, ride-sharing. Yeah, ride-sharing is very <clears throat> decentralized. Ride apps like Uber, Lyft, um, all those things. As we get into more of dispatching hubs, algorithms to control fleets of drivers and see changes within traffic Correct. that becomes decentralized. Cause now it's like all these vehicles would be, they would say, okay, th- there's traffic here. There's this going on that helps humanity. It gets you quicker from point A to point B. Um, and with blockchain, here's what can happen with ride sharing. This is really interesting. So now you have a distributed ledger drivers and riders could create a more user driven value oriented marketplace. Um, you have one, there's a startup called Arcade City. Yeah. It facilitates all transactions through a blockchain system. Arcade City operates similar to other ride-sharing companies, but allows drivers to establish their rates. 
See, that's cool. So it's saying I don't have to rely on Uber to establish a rate. I can take the same concept. Because Uber model. would be centralized. They're centralized. Why do, why do I have to ask them too? Why can't I just have a direct transaction? It doesn't go to Uber and then Uber pays me. I can just have the person in the back of the car pay me. I decide my own rates. And then if I want to pick someone up at that rate, I can drive around. Tartle. If this rate works for me on my data that wants to be sold, yes. I'm going to let it go. Yes. You know, these are the evolving things. These are the examples that are actually elevating us. And this is the dissemination of power back to individuals to make those choices. And people are beginning to realize that choice. Because what, what people don't realize is like with Arcade City, what their whole vision is. Okay, now you have these drivers, their ability. Maybe you like this driver. Now he can set up his own reoccurring customer base. The yeah. customer is his now. Yes. It's not Uber's, it's his. Correct. And then they can offer additional services to this customer base, deliveries, roadside assistance, whatever it may be. Correct. And listen, this, this is the, my guys, he's heavy, he's laying on the, the headphone. The, when you offer that to the individual, now they're really working for themselves. It teaches people self-responsibility at the same time. You don't have reliance on some other higher authority because, or saying that there is a higher authority. You know, that self-reliance helps you come to that realization that, oh, I can do this. I'm responsible. I can make it happen. I just need to understand. And it forces understanding. It forces learning. How can you not want to move into a system that has that? How can you not want to push people in that direction to give them a catalyst that actually evolves who they are? It allows that upwelling of creativity and creation to come out of them. It allows it to flow. Yeah, and, and, and something like with Tartle, like as we're getting data, as as you get data directly from the consumer, then you could turn around and say, this is what I like. You could turn around and say, oh, okay, we're getting direct consumer data. Yeah. So why don't we have Tartle have its own browser and then we distribute the ads according to their actual buying experience? Yeah, that's precisely and that, right. But they set that. Do they want fewer ads? Do they want more ads? Do they want less ads and it would be more targeted yeah, to you what? you set the term. And if, right. you, if you really want information on something you want to buy, great. Ask for it. Right. Not be told. Do you, do you like these ads? Do you think that these ads are good? Yeah. You know, and then go from there I instead know of the, turning around. The Brave browser is trying to get there. Yes. But it's it's still missing. There's still a little bit of a rub where it's like, okay, we're going to send you ads, but it's through our own network and, you know, we'll pay you for it. Right. You know, like I get it, but it's still not what people need. So the resources are still going in the wrong direction. It's not perfectly decentralized. Yeah, and and, and um, there's another one that I, people that are that they'll start talking about cryptocurrency, and they're like, well, you know, there's still middlemen, and there's still yes, there is now, but MIT, of course, um, Enigma is what they call it. Enigma is a developer of Catalyst, an off-chain decentralized exchange and investment platform that works without the need of a third party to act as a clearinghouse. Yeah. Why do, <laughs> so The only reason you had clearinghouses is because somebody wanted to make money in the right. middle. And there's one called Aux that's Ethereum-based. Yeah. So when you take, this is the key, when you take human, inter, uh, how do you say this word? Intermediaries? Intermediaries. Yeah, intermediaries. When you take those out, now you have, the lack of hacking, the lack of corruption, and the lack of human error. Correct. And so those three things. But they don't have to be. Now you're building just, trust. Yeah, you are building trust and you're removing risk. Hello. Yes. Now. now Hello. You know, it's so obvious. Yes. Yeah. It, what, but I mean, when, when you look at when you look at trust and the more trust, if you had 100% trust, yes. what is that speed like? It's instantaneous. You know? It, that's that's all it is. It's totally. Uh -oh. He's going. He's getting restless. Bone collector. Yes. Yeah, he's, he's, building bone a, collector. he's building a silo. No, but that instantaneous trust. You can't. Nobody can match that speed because you don't have to have someone check it in between. It's just we know that's yes. what it is. And I want to get into ex education and academia. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Decentralized education and academia. So this is important. Um, decentralized education. So if we look at information from a, uh, a decentralized standpoint, so the actual info you're receiving to learn a subject is say it's on the blockchain. Right. That means everywhere all across the globe is a supporting network to verify that, you know what, this information is not only historically accurate, all of these different people are going to vet it. Like, you know what, that is legit. And they're, it's almost like having a vote on the information. We as a consensus of a global society can say that this in fact did happen in history rather than going over to some you know dictatorial country and they tell you that the world doesn't operate like this. This didn't actually happen. No one ever did this. You know, we won the space race or whatever it might be. Right. It doesn't matter. But when you get that sort of dissemination of knowledge and you get truthful knowledge where it's been verified on a global network to say that it's been democratized, and people say that is in fact the truth, 
Now you have something powerful. Now you have accelerated learning on a truthful basis that allows people to just integrate information at an accelerated rate and not be bound by borders or the ability of having to go to a school because they can get it right through the internet. Yeah, well, people don't even realize verifying academic credentials. Sure. That is done with paper. That's what I'm talking and about. And humans. Yes. Yeah. So what happens is if you could streamline that verification process and then turn around and say, oh, okay, these are fraudulent claims. These are unearned credits. Yes. Um, that this IBM's actually working on this um, where they can share student records, you know, an IBM's huge silo. You know, you know, you can do on Turtle. You just put your student record in it right from the school and then you can share it as much as you want. You know, they can work all they want on it, but you know, it's already done. The question is, do, do you want to do it? Right. The tools there, the availability is there. Do you want to do it? Do you actually want to evolve, take on the responsibility and get it done? Do you want to build that system of trust? Or do you want to keep living in the dark ages? But why Why wouldn't, okay, so decentralized education, why, the, why wouldn't you be able to put it into the parents' hands then? Hold, hold on a second. You can. But when people think decentralized education, the first thing they think of is universities. Yes. They're the biggest money makers. Oh. They're the biggest money makers. And on top of that, you're seeing that, you know, if they're pulling in all this cash and you're saying, I can get a specific, much more in tune, highly more in depth, more resource rich education for no cost at all. Why would I go to a university? I only go there because somebody has to say that I went to it. They got to give you a piece of paper to say that you're an educated. A piece of paper. Think about that. It's 2020. Yeah. And you got to get a piece of paper. It's that physical Somebody has to hand it to you. Right. And you had to pay for it. You had to pay for that term to go through it. You had to accrue all this debt, but you could have, you know, frankly spent $4 on a library Books that cost $100 and, yeah. um, and parking spots that cost $500. You Think about that at the university. So if it's you want to pay rates. for, I mean, you know, these poor students, I, I see it at, here at the university, you yeah. know, they're paying $500, $750 just for a parking spot for the year. No, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. The amount of debt that you have to move through just so you can educate yourself, it's another barrier. So removing that barrier and children, they all have tablets now. They all have phones. Yes. They have access to knowledge and information. There's so many applications out there that actually can teach them mathematics. The the simplest guy that kind of started that. So you had Wikipedia, which was a dissemination of knowledge. It's, Wikipedia needs a lot of tuning. Wikipedia right. needs blockchain. Yes. In my opinion. But if we're looking for, you know, a real educational growth platform, you know, Khan Academy was the guy that really kicked it off. Yes. To show that it was possible that you don't need the school. You can receive a high quality education online through the internet through a free dissemination of knowledge. And if you're in the if you're in the educational field and you're a teacher, professor, whatever, why would you not for humanity want a decentralized because learning they, materials? They don't make why would you not it. want just think about that? I I want us to get away from all the others. Learning <laughs> materials, the ability to have somebody in Africa that has a tablet that is given to them, why would why could they not have the same privilege? I'm using the word privilege. And opportunity. And opportunity that someone that's sitting in Massachusetts. They can. We're not giving it to them though. And if you're a teacher, if you were a real teacher, you don't do it for the money. You do it because you understand the value and the power in the dissemination of information and knowledge. That's what a real teacher is. They don't do it for the money. They do it because they know that is the evolving catalyst for a human being. That's the most important part. Yes. Those are the true teachers. And the ones that are creating these systems that are doing this, that guy who started Khan Academy, worked at a hedge fund, he's a true teacher. He doesn't ask for any money. He's actually trying to disseminate information and knowledge. He's trying to uplift everybody all across the globe. Yeah, and, and, and I want people to get this because I want to make it really practical with blockchain. So let's say you want to purchase a vehicle. Everybody yeah. does that. Yep, yep. So let's get into, because I want to push back this for sake of time and everything. I want to, because we have a lot of these and I'm trying to get through each system because I want people to understand how it's going to affect every single part of their life. You got a title and a pink slip. Yeah, yeah. And registration yep. of the vehicle, um, insurance. Emissions testing. Uh, emission testament, an agreement between um, the manufacturer, you know, whether it's, let's say Mazda, for instance. So it's Mazda, a dealership, whatever it may be. Yeah. So you have DocuSign now, which yeah. is kind of a tool. But imagine the blockchain public ledger. Imagine a blockchain public. He's he's like, oh, good boy. Hopefully, everybody can see this. Oh, they can the, see it. This they're yeah, gonna, oh he's yeah. Like he's like, what do you got up there? Can I talk? <laughs> yeah. Get on the mic, bro. <laughs> Get on the mic. You like uh, you like cars? Is that what you like? He said. Yeah. He said. Did you say Mazda? <laughs> so when you get on, when you get at that, think about that. So if this technology was been in practice, it's not a stretch to imagine that registration, insurance, everything would be done on that one ledger. 
All one ledger. And you don't just have to look through multiple bodies to yes. associate that, oh, this car was a I need to talk to a salesman. I need to talk to a finance manager. I need to talk to a sales manager. I need to talk to the manufacturer. I need to find the pricing online and, and, and get this Costco pricing or KBB yeah. or all that stuff would be done. It doesn't need to exist it, anymore. That, none of that needs to and exist. And all those people that wanted to cut that were draining a system yes. that drains the value out of yes. it, they don't need to be there. Yes. Go put your focus on something else that's important. And, and so let's get, I want to get into another one, cloud storage. Oh, yeah. cloud is coming huge. Cloud's huge. Yeah, we actually use it um, on our system. I, I don't want to keep talking about this, but we use this thing called Kubernetes. Right. So you have the cloud, right? It's a server somewhere. But the thing is, how do we decentralize that server? Mm. So it allows us to set up the system of containers. So if one fails, something can instantaneously data replace loss, it, right. right? So there's no data loss in the system. There's no downtime. And if like a hard server drops, there's tons more to come up and spin or, up and take that place. hard server gets attacked? Yes, we don't have to worry about it. There's, and we have the security disseminated right. across everything. And that's from that. the cloud standpoint. Yeah. Um, one of the ones that people don't realize um, that can help with this, especially in a holistic way, how blockchain is forecasting. Sure. We always forget that word. Yeah. So research, analysis, consulting, like they, they have a machine learning that can look at um, millions of a lung that has a cancer in it and then spot that, and they've taught it. Well, then in, in seconds, it can look at millions of these x-rays yeah. and then come up and say, okay, this one has this, this one has this. You know, where it would take a group of expert doctors to come to together, through, to come together yeah. and then to look at millions of x-rays, it would take years and years and years for that. Correct. So this is something I think that you're going to see when you look at data analysis and you look at forecasting operations – we're going to be able to get targeted predictions and insights, like specifically and in real time. It'll be in real time because we have the ability to share that information accurately, transparently, and with traceability right to the source that requires it. Yes. And, and so what is forecasting like for the future of forecasting with Tartar? What does that look like? If forecasting, you know, forecasting is great to assume like where the growth of something's going to be. So if you're talking about like a tumor, right, we can forecast that the tumor will give us big, you know, on our past data. But when you're looking at Turtle, you know instantaneously what's going to happen. That's the most important part. You are, you know at this moment with complete certainty that this is going to be the outcome. And you get to watch that outcome for any length of time. And, and I want people to get this in understanding how they – we talked about property and stuff like that. But let's use this one, the music industry. So you create some art. Mm. You create music. Yeah, did you really it's create so that It's so siloed now. now. Yeah. Could you imagine if it was on blockchain, how it would be able to, if somebody wanted to pay you for your music, right? why do you need a record company? <laughs> no, you don't. You don't at all. And we're, we're actually seeing that, that change in the industry. Why do you have to sign over your sovereignty yeah. for the art that you created? Why'd you sign over your creativity to them? Yes. yes. Wrong. You know, you own to that. Cre- that's it. your yeah. creativity. Right. So Jason, I kind of then what does this mean for everybody? Yes. You know, I, I we're an hour 15. So I'm just like, oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah. So I'm just like, what the I wanna, last time I looked, it was at 40 minutes. Right. What I want to know then for the audience is like, what can we learn from this? Like, right. where's, what's the next step then from what, from my perspective, this is moving us towards that. Again, we're bringing both those rails together. It's technological evolution and evolution of the human being. And that's where we get the real development of the utopian values of society. And that's where that's headed. And I think that's what the catalyst is here. And I think if we're asking our listeners to anything is to look at these ideas, these philosophies that are inherent in this and realize that this tool mirrors themselves naturally how they work and what's going on with, you know, creation around them. And if you continue to move through those principles and, you know, adopt them or integrate them into your daily life, you're going to recognize the benefits of the things that we've actually been looking through. Yeah, I love that. I want to end on one because I know this is a political issue and something that I began to realize when you really think about this decentralization is weapons, yeah. guns and stuff like that, and how that they could be tracked on blockchain. Yeah, you could have full traceability of it. Yes. Right now, people can like scratch off, you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, the number, the serial number or whatever. Yeah, but what yeah. you could do is you could inlay in the metal um, a certain RFID Yes. That's in the metal. It can't be scratched off, right? right? Like a frequency or a code. And those transactions will all be recorded as that gun follows from person to person. Wherever to person. it goes. Yes. Right. Wherever it goes. Government to government or whatever it may be. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic idea. It's decentralization. That is the future. Yes. That's what we're excited about. All is one. Yes. All is one. A decentralized one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. Yep. Thank you. 
Look within. Look within. Look within. And live your life on the edge of two worlds. A reality where you find true understanding of who you are. The learning is done. Become the teacher in embodying the oneness of all. Walk the cliff's edge between the seen and the unseen realities. Become a higher density being. Please go to www.higherdensityliving.com.com.